You are now in the Reality Capture Network. Welcome to the Reality Capture Network. Today we're excited to get in and talk about a industry we haven't really gotten into a whole lot. So thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And let's start with introducing you. So your name and let's start with kind of your background. Where are you from? So my name is Sarah Hoffman. I am actually from Boise, Idaho. So oh, I'm awesome. born and raised here um, over on the West Bench. And then I moved to South Carolina for college. I went to Clemson. Um, and it's there that I started working in biology. So my, my degree is in biological sciences. Um, and I sort of thought I was going to go the traditional doctor route or physical therapy, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. And um, in my junior year, I started an internship doing coral reef restoration in the Florida Keys. That's um, fun. Yeah. <laughs> and then once I figured out that some people get paid to scuba dive on a regular basis, I decided that the traditional medicine route was not mm -hmm. as appealing. Um, so I did two years of that research in the Keys, um, and I really fell in love with diving, and I really fell in love with that part of Florida. I think it's still one of my favorite places to be. Yeah, most people don't get to go do that unless they're on vacation. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> full-time vacation jobs. That yeah. sounds cool. <laughs> you know, and eight hours of diving every day is, is oh, hard to complain rough. about. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, so it was kind of at that point that I realized that I really wanted to do research um, and particularly conservation and wildlife research. Mm -hmm. um, and I did really love this, the work that I was doing with corals, but um, I've always been kind of a charismatic megafauna person. So when I was looking at grad school, I was looking a lot at bigger animals. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always been really interested in anatomy and applied anatomy. And corals don't move a whole lot. So there wasn't a, yeah. <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot of biomechanics happening in that world. Um, but that's where I really switched and moved into the shark world. Mm -hmm. So I did my master's and my PhD at Florida Atlantic University, which is down in Boca Raton, Florida. Um, and my the focus of my research was um, swimming kinematics. So how do sharks move? Um, why do they move like that? And then also why do sharks that live in different environments have differently shaped bodies mm. and use those bodies differently? Mm. Okay. So on a higher level, what, what would be the reasons people would research those types of things? Yeah. So I think that's a really good question, particularly in the biomechanics world. And I think that when we are looking at those really sort of, you know, we call it basic research, mm -hmm. right? To understand what these animals are doing. And, um, the, the two answers that I kind of can come to are that understanding how animals interact with their environment is really critical to being able to understand what aspects of those environment are important for their survival. Okay. Um, so for example, one thing that we, one thing that I looked at in my dissertation was how do animals that live in really architecturally complex environments, so rock and reef areas, mm -hmm. Are, how are they shaped differently? How do they um, interact with their habitat differently? And, you know, they are finding little nooks and crannies to hide in um, and things like that. So mm -hmm. as we see the degradation of these coral reef environments or the degradation of some of these more complex environments, that means that we are also going to see less areas for these animals to exist in sort of their natural state. Okay. So that's kind of one answer. And then the other answer, I worked a lot with ocean engineering. Mm -hmm. So FAU has a really big ocean engineering campus. Um, and a lot of what we did was with biomimetics, uh, which is the study of or the application of naturally occurring shapes or functions to human design. Mm. So, for example, um, I think the best or most broadly understood um, example of biomimetics is Velcro. Okay. So back in the 1800s, um, a Swiss engineer noticed that these seed pods were sticking in his dog's fur really mm -hmm. well, and that's how he designed Velcro. Okay. So um, what we were working towards is trying to get a better understanding of the different materials as well as the different motions that these animals are using 
Um, so you wouldn't, for example, put one of those really amazing tuna robots that go search mm-hmm. the open ocean. That's probably not going to be as effective if you're monitoring a coral reef environment. You want something smaller. You want something mm-hmm. softer. Um, something that can maneuver a little bit better. Okay. So that's sort of the second application of the work that we were doing. Okay. So what what are some of the technologies when you were studying and getting into this? What were you guys utilizing or how were you going about the research? So the biggest thing as I in my in my master's, I looked primarily at just straight swimming. So okay. animals moving um, in a straight line, which is really nice and easy because you can control mm-hmm. pretty much all of the variables except for the animal. Yeah. Um, and there is less literature, less research on, we call it unsteady swimming. So animals that are maneuvering or escaping, you know, Mm -hmm. escape responses, things like that. So that's where I was really interested in how are animals using their bodies to produce these really athletic maneuvers. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go look at um, these sharks in the wild, you know, I think it's almost shark week actually. So, yeah. <laughs> um, they just move in these really amazing ways. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to understand how they did that. Um, and so the second component of that was understanding that in 3d, you mm-hmm. know, there, we miss so much by looking at things on a planar level that are happening in multiple mm-hmm. dimensions. So I was super fortunate to work with, um, a woman, her name's Elizabeth Brainerd at Brown, who developed this amazing open so- source software called XROM. Mm. Or um, and essentially, we were we put little beads all over the shark, so super glued them on, mm-hmm. um, and then we had two submerged underwater cameras pointing towards an overlapping volume of interest that we calibrated. Um, we did a couple different things. We had you know a checkerboard calibration, mm-hmm. or we had a 3D calibration object as well. Um, and then we would wake the sharks up, put them in that arena, and we were able to elicit the maneuvering behaviors that we were looking for. That's so, really cool. Thanks. Yeah, it was it was really neat. Is the first application of XROM in that way. Um, traditionally, it's it's a really neat technology. They are embedding radio opaque beads into the bones of animals mm. um, and using X-ray cameras so that you actually can look at how bones are moving in 3D. Wow! So we, you know, kind of took it a step back from that cool factor, yeah. but looking at these external movements mm-hmm. using that same sort of reality capture technology. Um, and the other really great thing is that it is a free open source software. Mm. So. Um, you know, available to most. And then it has these great extensions into Maya. Uh, Okay. And so all of that animation we were able to do in Maya. So I was able to take those different points, you know, the XYZ coordinates Mm -hmm. of all those points and put them into Maya and then look at things like the relative movement or rotation of the fin, which is what I was interested in, to the body. Okay. Very cool. Okay. So now I have to ask, first time diving down with sharks. How was that? Oh, it's incredible. <laughs> it is just... More the, excitement or fear? Or how, how were you feeling getting into that? I, there's definitely a little bit of nerves, uh-huh. I think. You know, you I definitely have a big respect for wildlife in mm-hmm. general. Um, but it is just so humbling to be in the water with these animals. And they are so graceful. Yeah. It's just, it's it's mind-blowing. It really puts you in your place in your puny human body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen, you see a lot of videos out there of, of people diving and, you know, a lot of different... Uh, different reactions to what sharks are yeah. or or how they are is you know you, you see videos of them attacking cages but then you see videos of divers like swimming with them and hugging them and like them coming up to you all nice what it, what's your kind of take on on them yeah so i think i i think those really you know aggressive mm-hmm. videos that we see i would guess that something has been done to elicit yeah. that response you yeah know? Um, I never had that experience. Uh, everything was very tranquil. Um, they, I've done baited dives and non-baited dives. So on the baited dives, they take down a crate and mm-hmm. then bring the animals in. And even when they're feeding, they're just curious. You yeah. know, they're coming to check you out. And I think something that we forget with wildlife is that they don't experience their environment with their hands, mm-hmm. right? So they're not going to come touch you they're going to come at you with their mouth yeah and that's just how yeah. that's just how it is that's mm-hmm. how they experience their environment so understanding 
that aspect and this animal is just curious they Mm -hmm. want to see what you are it's not as intimidating i guess yeah yeah okay very cool so then what was next so through your studies um you know what then took you into you know where did you go after school yeah so i I was super fortunate in my graduate program to work a lot with NOAA Fisheries. Um, They have a lab up in Narragansett, Rhode Island. So I did some offshore surveys with them where we would tag along on commercial sword fishing boats, essentially, and tag any of that shark bycatch. Mm. So just getting tags out out on animals to get a better idea of that population abundance. Um, And then I, I taught And I, well, I first took and then I taught classes out at the University of Washington Friday Harbor campus. Okay. Um, So I did that for a little bit. And um, I, being back in the Pacific Northwest, it really spurred me to come home. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I loved Florida. I love the weather. I hate snow. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But um, the ability to access nature is a lot harder down there. Mm. Um, You pretty much need a boat if you're going to go out. There's some shore dives and things like that you can do, but to get out and really explore. And the public land we have here, you know, even just the foothills, but then I also do like a ton of back backcountry backpacking. So that was sort of my big push to come home. And I think I was so um, career driven before that that I mm-hmm. never really let the idea of where I want to be yeah. <laughs> yeah. be a factor. So yep. for the first time, I was like, okay, you know, it's time to, to mm-hmm. really look out here. And then actually, while I was teaching a class at Friday Harbor, um, one of my now coworkers put out a tweet that they were looking for a fisheries biologist oh, cool. um, at Biomark, which is here in Boise, Idaho. Um, and I had always known that I really wanted to go into industry. So I jumped on that opportunity and I actually got hired, um, about six months before I defended my PhD. So I I left Florida, I came back here, I started the job and then, um, wrapped everything up from here. Very cool. Okay. So moving out of the education side into the industry, what was your, your new focus? You know, what were you working on? So, um, I work for the Applied Biological Services Division of Biomark. Biomark is an industry leader in RFID technology, so radio frequency ID, um, which are just microchips, right? Mm -hmm. Like the same kind of microchip you put in your pet. Yeah. Um, It's probably actually made by one of our parent companies. So um, at Biomark, we focus more on the application of that technology to wildlife systems. Um, And within our little ABS division, um, we focus on, it's very much like a consulting firm. Mm -hmm. So the majority of our business is funded by grants or contracts, um, you know, with the Bonneville Power Administration or the Bureau of Reclamation. So focusing on the recovery of endangered salmonids. Okay. So Chinook salmon and steelhead are our primary focus. Okay, awesome. So what technologies and you know what, what types of things are you doing, you guys, you and your departments um, on a normal basis? So, and that's actually probably a good point. So I was really hired to figure out how to take the tools that have been developed for Columbia River Basin salmon and um, apply them into other environments, which mm. is kind of why I'm this token marine biologist in a landlocked state. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I want to first acknowledge all of the work. We have such an amazing team and they have developed these really incredible um, tools for, for monitoring those populations. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of this work began many years ago um, using pit tag technology to track um, status and trend monitoring for for these declining populations. So there is an amazing amount of infrastructure in our rivers, um, these pit tag antennas that are marking or they're, they're reciting all of these marked animals as they move mm. throughout the Columbia River Basin. So um, maybe just to back up a little bit, um, salmon, so especially the Chinook salmon mm-hmm. and the steelhead that we are working with, they are anadromous, meaning that they spawn in freshwater tributaries and then move out to the ocean and spend some part of their juvenile life in the ocean. And then they will come back up okay. those same tributaries okay. um, and spawn there. And then after they spawn, they, they die and... Um, their fry or their par, <clears throat> excuse me, mm-hmm. will um, rear in those tributaries before they complete that next migration. Okay. So we wanted to understand where are these different animals spending their time, um, 
where are the juveniles versus the adults, um, just to get a better understanding of how these animals are interacting with their environment and how we, as land managers, can improve those areas for different um, life stages and species. So um, the, the folks that I work with are, are big quantitative ecology folks. Okay. Um, so a lot of biostatisticians bio-st- and data scientists. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've developed these models to measure um, you know, total population abundance, how many fish are there, and then also using those, that infrastructure of those in-river antennas, where are the fish moving, um, and in now in real time. So okay. especially if we think about something like adults, um, that are recreationally fished for. That's a big thing in the mm-hmm. Pacific Northwest. Um, states can better manage their fisheries if they know the proportion of natural to hatchery origin fish. Okay. So we want to target those hatchery fish mm-hmm. um, for recreational fishing in order to maintain those natural populations. So we can use these models to tell our managers, okay, in this reach of river, you have... 80% more hatchery fish than natural fish. Mm. So um, that's one of the applications that we use with the, the pit tagging tools. Okay. Um, and since then, we have shifted a lot into um, habitat monitoring. So there was a program that started in the early 2000s called the Columbia Habitat and Monitoring Program Protocol, CHAMP. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a way to start standardized habitat monitoring efforts throughout the Columbia River Basin since there are so many different managers and practitioners. So how do we get data that can be compared throughout this very large spatial extent? Um, And back in the day, crews, full crews would go out with total stations Mm -hmm. and measure all of these habitat variables, which is super costly, Mm -hmm. um, you know, very time intensive equipment intensive and then you're also really limited by the sites that you can access yeah um so that that occurred for a number of years and we have this wealth of champ data but now with how quickly habitats change and how quickly you know these environments particularly are being degraded Mm -hmm. um we have to think about ways to collect those data more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Um, So how do we get real-time habitat information, especially in response to big events like floods Mm -hmm. um, or even restoration events? And that's where we've really shifted into using drones as a way to collect high-resolution habitat data um, and implement those metrics that we can pull off of drones and drone products into our modeling. Okay. And are you using photogrammetry? Have you done aerial LIDAR? And, and what all types of uh, areas are you trying to capture? Is it still around like rivers? Are you doing, you know, land? Or are you trying to still gather underwater? What's kind of your focus within the UAV and and capture. Yeah, so for this application in the rivers, it's all the the riparian environment. So okay. the river and then the floodplain. Okay. Um, and we are using photogrammetry. Mm-hmm. So um, we do we fly surveys with overlapping images, and mm-hmm. then we use um, a software called Agisoft, mm-hmm. which is now MetaShape, okay. um, to ortho rectify mm-hmm. um, and mosaic those images together. Okay. Um, so what that can produce, you know, it'll produce your ortho mosaic, which is the full landscape or the full flight yep. that you conducted. Um, and then you also get a dense cloud. So you do have the ability to go in and 3D render. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we also uh, work with digital elevation models from okay. those drone flights. Um, okay. And so we do. We have a remote sensing expert. His name is Richie Carmichael, and he really deals with all of these products. And he's also pretty experienced in bathymetric LIDAR. Okay. So now we're trying to incorporate all of those technologies Um, and really leverage every information we Mm -hmm. can, especially the publicly available data, into improving our our estimates. And that can be a really challenging thing, especially from a statistical standpoint, is taking multiple different sources of data that are honestly, you know, pretty imperfect Mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of different measures of uncertainty and combining them into one, Mm -hmm. one, you know, common currency. Um, So that's another thing. We're really fortunate to have these biostatisticians and data scientists. Mm -hmm. So um, this was really the work of Kevin C. and Mike Ackerman, and they were able to take 
all of these sources of data um, and combine them into a, a relevant model. Okay. Are you guys using any other types of sensors or anything on the drones apart from just capturing imagery, you know, thermal or anything like that to see, you know, down into the water? Yep. So um, in 2018, which is, you know, the first year we really rolled out, uh, we call it the DASH protocol or the Drone Assisted Stream Habitat Monitoring. Okay. Um, and so that was flown with a DJI Phantom, mm -hmm. Hyra's. Um, RGB imagery, mm -hmm. and then um, we have since incorporated multi-spec imaging. Okay. So we have RGB, um, long wave infrared, near infrared, and red edge. Um, and the inclusion of that multi-spec imaging helps, um, there's additional data we can get. So for example, um, there's an index called NDVI, which is a measure of vegetative health, mm -hmm. essentially. So we have that added data, um, but it's also helping differentiate something like the river from the bare earth mm -hmm. um, much better, which helps when we are developing these automated machine learning classifiers. Mm -hmm. So having more contrast between the elements that we're really interested in, having those extra three bands really helps us automate the extraction of data from our imagery. Okay. So thinking about your what you guys are focused on and where, where you're trying to continue pursuing into, what what's something in the technology that you could you know see changing or hope to see in the future is there something you know that is a struggle still whether it's an improvement in a hardware or a software or you know what what's something you could see technology wise helping that's a great question and you know we drones have been proven to be this cost efficient very safe way to collect um, imagery from these remote locations mm -hmm. In fact, there's this really fascinating paper um, that showed, I think it was something, it was over 80% of the deaths that incur in wildlife related jobs are from accessing sites. Mm. So, you know, a helicopter, airplane, yeah. vehicle, boats, yeah. you know, all of those incidents. So now that we have drones, we can do this in a much safer way mm -hmm. and we can get to these areas that we couldn't before. But even without, or, you know, even considering that there's very little adoption of this technology mm -hmm. in our field right now. Um, and the biggest barriers to entry are really image processing and data mm -hmm. processing. So, all right, you flew a kilometer of river and now you have 500 yeah. gigabytes of data. What are you going to do with it? Yeah. Um, and that's where we are really trying to step in and lead the way in developing these post-processing yep. products. Um, and I think that really is the way of the future until there's a way to more efficiently and more easily process those data mm -hmm. into meaningful estimates or meaningful yeah. metrics. I don't think it will be broadly adopted into our world. And I think that's actually something that I encountered a little bit working in conservation is, you know, we, we are biologists. Mm -hmm. I'm a biologist. Everything I've learned about technology has been brute force, self-taught mm -hmm. YouTube, you know? Yeah, sure. So um, I think, you know, we are are more interested in the answers that the technology can give us. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what our, our grants and our contracts are paying for, you know, yeah. to be able to give people an understanding of how we can improve, mm -hmm. you know, the management of these endangered species. So the developing tools that make that technology more accessible to folks, um, especially, you know, if we think about the marine world, there's a ton of work happening in um, countries that can't really afford this technology. Mm -hmm. So how yeah, do we definitely. make, yeah, how do we make these tools more accessible um, to folks out there? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a universal problem. Um, you know, most of the people we've talked with, uh, you know, are in different industries, of course, you know, in architecture, forensics and, but really every discussion we have is around these types of technologies, you know, the laser scanning, the collecting data, you know, geomatics, drones. And I think the data size and data processing is something that's continuing to be an issue. Stored, you know, storing the data, transferring data to other people in other offices, you know, the time it takes uh, to host it in the cloud, all of those issues, um, whether it's from drone or laser scanners, uh, once you get that data, creating something usable is, is probably the biggest, um, biggest area for improvement still, um, collecting the data, you know, you, you can go out with a drone and in an hour have thousands of photos, but then you've got 
a thousand photos, <laughs> right. you've got to figure out how to process those and then and then turn it into something that's actually going to help your pursuit, whatever industry it is that you're you're in. So that's uh, we're continuing to try to spread that uh, feedback back to the hardware and software people, you know, that are watching our videos and in our network, so that we can continue to direct and try to help um, further develop, you know, different processes and, and different software. So thank you for your feedback. Yeah. I think that's a, it's a really interesting problem, and there was I just read another paper about um, c- software and conservation, mm-hmm. and you know it, there has been a ton of of improvement and steps forward in using, um, especially if we think about like ecological modeling um, and things like that in the conservation industry. But it's a huge problem because. It, it has been well this paper speculated that it's been largely ignored by industry because it's not a big enough profit margin Mm -hmm. you know it's not a big enough industry to tackle and then the majority of that development is happening in academia by biologists not Mm -hmm. computer scientists um, who have such high turnover rates with grad students that there's no consistent maintenance or development of software. So mm-hmm. software and technology um, in the conservation world, this is a, a, a problem that continues or has been an issue and we continue to face. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully we'll continue to see improvement there. Um, anything else you'd like to talk about? Yeah, so you know we, we are we are developing these tools, and I think of particular interest is the machine learning work that we've okay, been doing. Yep. Um, so we were so fortunate to hire a machine learning engineer this year. That's um, awesome. Yeah, Steve Corona, we we snagged him up. So um, one of the great things about being in industry and being at Biomark specifically is that we have access to these resources that other traditional conservation biology groups don't. Yeah. Um, so we have been able to expand into developing our own software um, for these applications. So he's been working a lot with um, developing classifiers to extract data from our processed imagery. So, and he's also been developing algorithms that process the imagery as well. That's awesome. He's a really great tool. Um, So in the river world, our, one of our remote sensing experts had previously, <clears throat> excuse me, developed a supervised random uh, forest pixel classifier. Mm-hmm. So being able to go in and pick out every pixel in your image that is bare earth, every pixel in your image that is the river. Mm-hmm. Um, and from that, you can get you know your polygons and extract things like river width, mm-hmm. um, percent vegetation, things like that. Um, and it works relatively well, but we're really hoping to incorporate object-based detection also yeah. to refine that process a lot. So that's what Steve's been working on. And our first application of that um, object-based classifier within the confines of um, a mask regional convolutional neural network is to imagery from South Florida. So I still have quite a few collaborators down there. Mm-hmm. and. Uh, one of my collabor- collaborators at the Florida Manta Project, um, they go out and they fl- fly drone surveys to find manta rays, okay. which, do you know what a, a manta yeah. ray is? Okay, so they're, these are juveniles, they're okay. baby manta rays, and they're nine feet wide. Baby nine feet. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so small one. Small, little babies. <laughs> um, so she's been running these boat surveys for a while, and the the belly pattern, there are these little spots on the belly, and you can use... Um, a software to identify individuals. Okay. So she's been going out and getting this individual identification of animals to get an idea of the population demographics. Um, But going out on a boat with a crew of four people Mm -hmm. and standing, I've done it, you stand on the bow of the boat and hope you don't fall off and Mm -hmm. you stare into the water Mm -hmm. and look for these critters and it's just, it's not the most efficient use of of time and you're also pretty limited by good boat conditions, right? So she sent me, you know, a terabyte of imagery from their drone surveys and Steve was able to go in and use an object-based classifier and you can run it through the imagery and it'll it'll track these mantas. That's so, awesome. And then if you pair that with the XTIF data from the drone, you can get the geolocation of those mantas and then wherever it's in frame of the video. So how fast was yeah. it moving and things like that. And is that with normal... Uh, RGB or is that also using certain uh, sensors or what what kind of imagery was that? That's just RGB. So that's, I believe, from a phantom. Um, But 
where we're looking to incorporate something like multi-spec imaging um, would be if we wanted to get more information about the habitat. Mm -hmm. So we're also doing this with sea turtles. Anything that is very recognizably different yeah. than the sand bottom yeah. comes up pretty well. So um, something we're hoping to do with sea turtles is not only identify and track um, the turtle, but then also use something like the added bands to investigate, you know, what sort of vegetation are they on? Mm -hmm. Are they over seagrass or are they over sponges? Okay. Um, and there's a group in in um, the panhandle of Florida that's done some really interesting work with satellite imagery, mm -hmm. um, multi-spec imagery, looking at water quality. Um, so that's something that we would really like to explore as well. Okay. Yeah, I would have, uh, we don't, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of experience around utilizing the imagery around the water, but I wouldn't have thought that it would have been clear enough to do that. So how deep are the rays and the turtles and things that you're able to pick out of those images? That's a good point. And it is totally dependent on your water quality. Yeah. So okay. in South Florida, we are very fortunate to have crystal clear yep. 80 foot viz, oh, you nice. know, so, um, and they're, they're by the coast. So they're within, okay. you know, 200 meters of the coast. Okay. Um, and with turtles, it's a very similar similar thing you can really only see them when they're at the surface mm -hmm. or maybe i don't know generously four feet below okay um but they have to surface to breathe yeah so um the application of this technology we've seen it a little bit in marine mammals for example so whales and dolphins and mm -hmm. seals because they have to surface yeah. so as long as your animal has to come to the surface at some point you know you can use drones for okay. those types of do the mana or... rays um, they stay very close to the shore okay. so, and they're so dark. They're pitch yeah. black. Um, so you can pick them out from the, the yeah. imagery easy. Very easily. Um, it is much more challenging when they veer off, yeah. but, um, the bulk of what we've seen both on the boat surveys and in the drone surveys is that they really hug in close okay. to the shore. So to capture the most, cause obviously they're not all always visible you know, when they're out there flying those, do they spend an entire day and keep flying the same area? Or, you know, is, is there a certain time frame or, you know, how do they deal with the capture to get the best data they can? Yeah. And that's something that we're still developing. So mm -hmm. I really wanted to get my hands on this imagery to see if it's something we could do. Mm -hmm. um, and we can. So that's now awesome. we're really interested in, all right, what do we do with that? Mm -hmm. And, um, the application that you talk about, what do you do with the animals that are moving in and out of visibility? Um, that's something shifting back to the turtle world where um, we can use something like mark recapture models. So it's the same thing as pit tagging. You mm -hmm. capture an animal, you tag it or you mark it mm -hmm. or something, and then you let it go. <clears throat> and you come back a day or two later and you see if that animal is there. And okay. if you have a big enough sample size, you can get an estimate of that abundance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and with turtles, they do this really neat thing where you catch a turtle. It's called rodeoing, by the way, there which you is go. awesome. So you are on a boat, you dive head first off a boat to get your arms around the turtle and bring it up to the surface because they're nice. big. Yeah. Um, How big? Well, so if they're juveniles, they're, this is a scientific term, they're dinner plate sized. Okay. So, yep. <laughs> um, mm. but then the adults, um, can get quite large depending on the species. Mm -hmm. So, you know, bigger, you have to really wrap your arms yeah. around them. Yeah. Um, and then they're bringing them up, they're tagging them, they're taking blood, measuring, um, weighing, looking at any, you know, types of scars or yeah. anthropogenic interaction as well as any tumors. And then they paint a big number on the shell okay. so that they don't resample it. Gotcha. So now that we have this big white number, we can get that mark mm -hmm. in our drone imagery and apply the same types of marker capture models we've used in the Columbia with pit tags mm -hmm. to um, this environment. That's awesome. So that's kind of one application. And then with the manta rays, because they are using the drones to locate the manta and then they have to take the boat over, dive in and get that ventral belly mm -hmm. shot. Um, something that I think would be super cool, which we haven't really dove into yet, but um, is onboarding our model onto the the drone control mm -hmm. software and then have it alert you every time it yeah. recognizes a manta and you say, okay, you know, we're yeah. flying the drone and here's manta mm -hmm. and then be able to go identify it. That would so, be awesome. Yeah. Maybe that's something can be worked on. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> awesome. 
Man, it's very interesting to see the different uses for a lot of the same types of technologies. I mean, um, seeing that a drone can be used for tracking animals and for, you know, habitat and for architecture and construction and forensic, it's really, it's really interesting to explore how these different technologies are being used. Um, this is definitely an industry we haven't heard a whole <laughs> lot about, and I don't think a lot of people really even realize the amount of effort and and the need and why um you know you guys do what you do um like even for myself being here in idaho going fishing you know you don't think that people are out there tracking how many fish are in the river and why and what and that, what are we doing about them and the natural versus the not and um so thanks for coming in and sharing information about you know what you guys are doing yeah, thanks for having me. And I, I think this podcast is super neat. And we are definitely limited by our understanding of where this technology is being developed. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of the tools that we, we're we adapting from other industries and, you know, kind of blindly <laughs> forging our sure. path forward. So it's really neat to have the opportunity to hear from experts. And, and I think one of the benefits of industry is now we have access to those experts too, and we can hopefully develop these tools more specified to our needs. Yeah. And that's our goal with this is to continue to spread education about um, what are the needs. You know, there's a lot of people developing technology, but they don't even know all the use cases for it, you know. Um, so as we continue to share and hear about uh, how it's being used in different industries, why, what are some of the future things, you know, needs that they see potentially in there, We're trying to continue to push the technology as well as the industry adoption. Um, you know, there's a lot of companies out there that haven't implemented any of these technologies yet. They don't, they've never touched a drone. They don't know why they're scared of them. <laughs> you know, a lot of companies, uh, are stuck in old ways. You know, there's a lot of people that it's hard to get them into something new. Um, so our goal is to really, again, continue to educate and talk with people like you guys and hear, hear what's going on, what the issues are, what the struggles are. And, uh, yeah, so we're, we're excited to hear and we're excited to share this with our network and thank you again for coming in and we'll have to stay in touch. Yeah. Thank you. This is great. Reality Capture Network, bringing the future to you.